thank you all so much for being here. It's really an honor and a treat to, to work with you. And I'm loving some of these fears, some of these feelings that are coming into the chat. Keep them coming. Um, this is really common, what I'm hearing from a lot of students. Are they going to be able to finish? What's the economy going to be like? How really can we help students prepare during this really uncertain time? And so I'm here today to offer a space for us to really collaborate, brainstorm, pool resources that we've been hearing about, best practices, and then also just share with you what, um, and hopefully equip you with a lot of tools and resources moving forward. So I am going to go ahead and do the infamous screen share. Bear with me one minute. So this is what we're going to do in the next hour. Um, like I said, provide a space for you all to share and learn from each other. And my hope and goal is that you will really leave today with some concrete tools, ideas, tips that you can bring back with your students and with colleagues. How that is going to work is I'm going to give a super quick intro. We're going to have a chance to brainstorm together. I'm going to share um, some best practices and then we're going to leave some good time for you all to work in small groups just to synthesize everything that we're going to get through today. And so you can share with each other. What do you think stands out. What other ideas might you have or what do you want to bring back to your campus. So quickly a little bit about me. I work at the Taylor Center for Social Innovation and Design Thinking at Tulane. And we are focused on helping students align their academic interests with their desire to, um, to create positive social impact. And the program that Emily alluded to is um, one of the programs that I run is Tailor Your Life, which is a change making career development lab. Um, we have about 25 sections that are offered per year and it helps students really think like a designer to design a career with social or environmental impact. And the main way that we do this is through reframing, instead of having students focus on what is this one static job you want to do, to what problems do you want to tackle over your career. And then using that as an entry point to really understand the ecosystem of change makers and movers and shakers in their field. And speaking of problems, we are now uh, living in a COVID-19 world. And so what that means is, or their job offer was rescinded. They are facing, we're facing this economic recession. They might have more limited geographic mobility um, as they're in quarantine and not able to move. They might really be struggling financially and the list kind of goes on and on and on. And so really the question is, what happens now? I've seen some really interesting projections for what this might look like. And this might be familiar to some of you. A lot of people are hoping, right, economy went down, it's gonna come straight back up. Or maybe it'll be more like a U curve. It slowly went down and we're slowly gonna crawl back up. But what we're really preparing our students for and what I think is more likely is more of this W where it's up and down and it really might take a while to stabilize. And so this is the world that I hope we will all begin to help prepare our students for. In a post COVID-19 world, there's a lot happening, right? There's health and safety concerns, economic turmoil. And what I really want to drill home is that you can help students focus on the elements of the job search where they really have control and that their strategy and goals should be shaped by both professional and personal factors, including their priorities, constraints, resources, what is it that they're willing to sacrifice and what does a high quality of life and sense of well being mean to them. So I'm going to give you some concrete questions that you can ask students to begin to have this conversation. The first is, what is your top priority? That might be based on finances to pursue a certain career path. It really might depend giving the students circumstance. What constraints do they have? Is there a location that they're bound to? Might they have visa, visa constraints or family factors? 
financial and non-financial. Some people in the chat said social capital, right? Are they a part of alumni or professional networks? And if the answer is no to these, how can you help become an ally to really connect them in with these alumni contacts or professional resources? What sacrifices are you willing to make? For what amount of time? So this might mean considering an adjacent position or field. If they're we're dead set on working for that museum. Maybe now they're considering other arts nonprofits, right? Expanding their idea of what sort of field they want to go into while still gaining valuable skill sets. And then finally, how is their quality of life and sense of well being? What do they really need to feel fulfilled and happy, both financially as well as geography or other factors? Could they really handle a, a portion of, the, of time being unemployed or underemployed? And all of these considerations are really valid and will take into account how you can help coach and support your students. Another, real, another, another thing I really want to encourage is for you to encourage flexibility. So could they take a short term or temp position, the adjacent positions, as I mentioned? What about short term sources of income? And then how can they build their skills in ways that might not be the traditional getting a job straight after college or during college. They also might want to consider a combination of paid and unpaid options. So yes, take that really wonderful unpaid internship, but then also don't be afraid to take a paid administrative job that's completely unrelated. You're gaining skills and you are financially supporting yourself. So for those Anyone here work with international students? Maybe, maybe a little bit. Yeah, I'm seeing some head nods. So some things to consider. I'm not going to get into this a lot, but that a lot of them um, depends on their OPT. And so you want to ask them these same questions, but focus on how can they, would volunteering help them fulfill OPT requirements? Is that worth it if they can't find a paid job? Um, would they consider extending their studies? what would it mean for them to return to their country of citizenship? That should be an option that they explore just because we really don't know what is ahead. Um, many universities, I won't say all, I know Tulane has an Office of International Students and Scholars, and so make sure that they're connecting directly with those resources so the folks there can really help them consider the short-term and long-term consequences. Okay. The hardcore messaging that I encourage you to tell your students is there's more than one right answer for how to do this. So first of all, don't freak out. <laughs> we're, we're in a very uncertain time, but there's lots of potential resources and options moving forward. They might hear no more than they're comfortable with. And just to prepare them for that upfront, companies will be looking at what they did during this time. Forevermore, I gave. 2020. How did you gain resources? How, how, did you, how can students demonstrate that they were flexible and resilient and adaptable? And that some of these techniques I'm about to share with you and that you've already shared on the Google Doc do require you to be a little bit pushy. And they're not for everyone. And I just want to say that up front. And part of your role supporting students is going to be to balance the, the challenge and support we talk about in higher ed and get them to step a little bit outside of their comfort zone so they can uh, be resilient and gain some of these opportunities. Which are, this whole list is what I'm going to breeze through in about the next 10 minutes before we open it up to you. So let's dig in. The first is to diversify your job search. Um, in one, on one hand, students are bound by geography if they're quarantined, but on the other hand, they're no longer bound by geography at all. Offices are shutting down, people are now moving exclusively, a lot of companies are moving exclusively to remote work, so they can look for jobs outside of their city, outside of their country. This is a great resource, 80,000 hours. If anyone's heard of it, um, I'd love to see a hand or a wave or maybe. Uh, 80,000 hours is a platform that is focused on, you have 80,000 hours in your career. And so how can you use that for social or environmental impact? You can see here, there's 460 jobs posted now. Um, they're also being really good about bringing in new job opportunities that are after, 
post COVID-19 industries that are booming. Um, and so this is a great resource you can point your, your students to. There's also a ton of other resources for flex jobs and gigs, right? If they're getting that unpaid internship, but they still need a way to be paid, consider flex jobs or short-term gigs. Another issue that we're seeing across universities is students' internships was canceled, were canceled. And so what are their options? Well, the first is to say nothing, go home and sulk. The second is to get a little bit mad about it. And the third is to call back and to ask them, can I do something remotely? Can I do something for free? When things come back, can I be the first person that you call? A lot of universities are also offering virtual work experience programs. This is the one at Tulane. So find out what your university is offering and really encourage your students to communicate to potential companies that they are coming in with a lot of knowledge. They already know how to work remotely. They already know how to self teach and they already know technology, honestly, a lot better than the professionals <laughs> than we do as we're trying to figure it out. They've been doing this for quite some time. So they can really take the responsibility to tell their employer, you know what, I will manage all of the remote, remote components of this. You don't need to deal with any of that. I'll set up all the Zoom calls. I'll organize all the materials online. I got that. And employers will be impressed and a lot more likely to have an intern sign on if they know they don't have to deal with that component. If oh, this was something that came up on the chat as well. So as I mentioned, take responsibility for structuring it. Tell students not to worry about the credit. They really just want a resume item. And how they can gauge and set up a successful internship is if it has three components by the end, which is a finished project that they can point to, meaning you don't necessarily want to work on a project that has a bunch of insider secrets that you can never then share an artifact of what you created, especially if you're not getting paid or you're not getting credit. A letter of recommendation and then an offer of extension repeat or higher. And so when a student is considering building an internship, and especially if they're doing it and it's unpaid, that they should really take responsibility to ask for, and if it takes it reminding, continual interaction with a mentor or, or a professional, so then they build that relationship for a letter of recommendation. And like I said, a project that stretches them that they can point to and share later. So this all leads into building relationships in general. How can students now use this time to build relationships? So on the chat, I saw getting active on LinkedIn, finding about your school's alumni platform. Tulane has something called Tulane Connect. Your school likely has a similar platform. Joining professional associations and then cultivate, go back or build new professional contacts. Um, the infamous informational interview, right? This is where you contact people in your field, you build connections. Another idea that I uh, saw recently that I thought was, was interesting was to do this with students, do this with younger people in your field and find one or two that you can actually have continued mentorship and tell them that they can then add to their resume, oh, I mentored a developing scholar or that, that they can gain experience through this as well. Building relationships with faculty. So tell your students that faculty are also freaking out, right? For any faculty on this call right now, this is a really challenging time for faculty. So get inside the faculty's head. What do they need? Maybe that they, there's data from an old project that, that they need analyzed. And the student can then gain the skill set of doing that assessment. They could be a test pilot for a course that's going online. Maybe the faculty member could be an informal advisor to a research project. Um, the student can also stalk the faculty member on LinkedIn. If the student does all this work for a faculty member, it's okay to ask to reciprocate of, hey, uh, Chrissy, I see that you are connected to this person at this company. Do you mind introducing me? And if students have done this work to build this relationship and help the faculty member, the faculty member will be a lot more likely to want to reciprocate. 
And also uh, tell your students that it's okay if the faculty member says no. Um, this is a challenging time. And like I said before, students might be hearing no more than they're used to. Okay. Enhancing or refining your online presence. I don't know the last time that anyone here Googled themselves, um, but your online presence in a socially distant world is even more important than it was before. So give it a shot. It, does anything come up that you don't necessarily want your employers to see? An old account or a gift registry. Take a look at social media accounts. Buff up your LinkedIn and consider doing an electronic port portfolio. Here's an example of one of my student fellows I've worked with in the past. And throughout her fellowship, we worked on translating or taking everything that she'd worked on that was in some folder somewhere and to make it an online portfolio that any potential employer could then look at. I always tell my students, uh, imagine, just, just try, to, try to come up with a number for how many hours you've spent writing essays throughout college. And then how few people actually read those essays, right? That faculty have these essays that are on a shelf somewhere. So spend a little bit of time, convert them into blog posts and put them on online, on a portfolio. And it demonstrates your writing skills, what you care about, and your knowledge of your field. In terms of a LinkedIn profile, um, I'd love quickly, anyone on this chat, what do we like about this LinkedIn profile? Anyone on the call, what's, what's good about it? You can type it in the chat or just shout it out loud. Very visual and thorough, okay. What else? From third parties, yep, that's good. Articles, pictures, followers, yes. Active replying, yes. So he's, been, he's engaged both ways. He's commenting on other people's, making things himself. He has 500 plus connections, which is the tipping point. Supposedly at 500 or more, you're connected to virtually everyone. His, his title shows it doesn't just say his name and his major. He has a really concise summary. He has a clear picture and he has articles linked about him. So all of these are ways that you can work on, help students work on their LinkedIn. It's also a really good time for students to polish their CV and resume. Skilling up, I saw this a lot in the Google chat as well. Um, for, for anyone that's familiar, or if you haven't yet looked at LinkedIn Learning, this is free for most students at most universities and staff. Here are all of the different courses that you can take for business, becoming a digital marketing specialist. Here's just an example of some of the free courses online. They have similar tracks for technology, as well as building creative skills. So students could use this time to learn everything that it takes to become a video editor, which would be a super valuable skill set for really any organization. And lynda.com or LinkedIn Learning is just one of many different platforms that offer the chance for students to skill up. There are also so many other ways to learn something. I'm just gonna click through. Maybe they're attending dissertation defenses, considering um, if they wanna potentially pursue a PhD, participating in a MOOC or self-study, going on YouTube, online videos, designing a product. I saw folks said, what about entrepreneurship? They can, they can gain skill sets in entrepreneurship. Independent studies. The list really goes on and on and on. There's a lot of talk now about the future of work. And this was happening even before COVID-19, when we're thinking about artificial intelligence and how the working world is really going to change. And the top skill sets, um, supposedly, that are going to be needed for the future of work are listed here. And so students can volunteer, or they can work with small businesses, or and it, using any of the skill sets or any of the tactics we just described, how can they proactively build some of these skill sets through those experiences? So it, it's helpful. Sometimes what I'll do is I'll have students research job descriptions that they 
are interested in. Um, that's actually one of their homework assignments is look up 10 different job descriptions and then come back with a list of skill sets that are wanted that you don't yet have. And then how can you proactively build getting those skills into your current job or internship or projects that you take on. It's also really being encouraged that this is a great time for students to apply to graduate school. Um, even if deadlines have passed, a lot of them are being A lot of students are also unaware that there are full-time paid professionals to meet one-on-one -on -one with them throughout the entire academic year. So connecting them to, with their career coach can, can be really helpful. And then the last thing I'm going to leave you with, and if you want more information about this, um, Emily is going to drop it in the chat. But in terms of how we approach this in terms of thinking like a designer and, and approaching this like a designer is encouraging your students and yourself to begin to accept that this is really where we are. Um, we don't, there's a, there is a lot of uncertainty and it doesn't mean accept like you have to like it, but it does mean accept that this is the reality, at least for the foreseeable future. Helping students really define what matters to them. That goes back to what are your constraints or what are your priorities? Helping them brainstorm a lot of different alternatives that there's no longer really a linear path, not that there ever really was, but there's a lot of different options that they can do based off everything we've talked about, everything in the chat. Thinking about how can they design experiments to test ideas. So those informational interviews, if they're talking to 20 different people in different potential fields, they're building relationships, potentially setting the stage for future virtual work experiences or internships, and they're testing, do I actually like this? Do, what is this person's life really like and what is their job really like? So how can they clarify their own pathway by consciously using this time? Uh, encourage students to be flexible. So we're all having to be really flexible right now, but be willing to adapt their plan. What they thought they were going to do a year ago or two months ago, it, it might be really different now. And believe that their worth, that their life is, is worth redesigning. Um, a lot of students and staff and faculty are struggling right now, and, and that makes sense that this is a really challenging time. But we are, I, I, I want to, I think it was Marina posted in the chat earlier. Like, can I still have a career with social impact, right? Can I, can I still do this? And my answer would be yes. Um, it might not be in the same step-by-step -step image that you had when just a few months ago, but there are a lot of different ways that you can build your skill sets and create this pathway that you want forward. Yes, well, that is a perfect segue into my last just 20 seconds that I wanna share. Um, which is about life design resources. So at Tulane, we, like I said, have about 25 sections per year, and we've made all of our resources, including instructor guides, worksheets, activities, PowerPoints, Canvas course, everything is available for free to educators. So um, feel free, <laughs> there's a link here, uh, I'll have access to the point afterwards. Um, if you also want to hear more about what life design is, I recently made a big, what we're calling a pillar post that has dozens of different links to activities and resources embedded within it and makes a specific stance about the call for change making life design. So incorporating everything from Burnett and Evans, as well as um, a bunch of other curricula and best practices and tools and resources to help students identify their change making pathway. Um, also in this presentation, so I, I'm really just a connector, right, that I, I'm gathering this information and sharing it, but I put a bunch of other resources for you that you're welcome to explore on your own at a, at a later time. So I know we're just a few minutes over, and I want to thank you all so much for taking this time to connect with me. And also, um, I would love to follow up about this conversation offline. If anyone else is thinking and wanting to do this or working in the career education space, please feel free to, to reach out. And thank you again, and I hope you have a great rest of your change leader retreat.